you know, you mentioned that George Bray made this funny comment offhand about the role of food frequency questionnaires, which is they're not worth the paper they're written on. Uh, and of course, John Ioannidis has famously said that um, the food frequency questionnaire belongs in the wastebasket. I mean, that's basically the only oh. place it belongs. And yet the food frequency questionnaire is the backbone, is the scaffolding of nutritional epidemiology. And so do you, as an empirical scientist, an experimental scientist, have concern at how much food policy is being driven by nutritional epidemiology rather than experimental science when we understand why you have to, you know, why, why there's an effort around nutritional epidemiology because these questions are otherwise difficult to answer. But given the fidelity of the data, i.e., the thing you put in the system to calculate isn't worth the paper it's written on, according to basically anybody who understands how it works. So how do we how do we reconcile this problem, right? Which is, I mean, even things that we're talking about now, which is the role of ultra processed food. Well, that's those are determinations from epidemiology. It's it's epidemiology that's at least telling us or hinting to us that ultra processed foods on balance are bad. That confirms what I think most people would into it. But where do we draw the line between what we are letting nutritional epidemiology tell us from a health policy perspective uh, to, to where maybe it's overstepping and getting things wrong because of the data integrity problem? I think the problem is really jumping from, uh, you, you know, basically nutritional uh, epidemiology to policies or labeling or dietary guidelines. And I think to me, now we are at a point that the epidemiology should basically provide us with hypotheses to be tested in better controlled situation and maybe in domicile with full feeding of people. I know this, these studies are expensive, but we are missing a step. And I think once again, uh, these new studies uh, from NIH, this consortia of nutrition for precision health, are going towards this direction of basically, you are right, the food frequency questionnaire is here every day for 10 days in this module one of the study. But then there are these other ways. There is the remote photography system that you yeah. take a picture with your phone of the plates. You have these cameras and all that. And I think that now we, I hope that we're not going to make policy only or policy or guidelines only based on the nutritional uh, epidemiology, but also on uh, diet uh, on uh, studies basically testing some hypotheses related to what the nutrition uh, uh, epidemiology has shown. Yeah, again, I, I think all roads, both from a personal health perspective and from a nutrition science perspective, need to point towards AI. And, and I, it's that, you know, it's such a cliche thing to say right now where everybody basically everybody's saying AI is everything. Um, but when people ask me, how is AI, how could AI change medicine? Um, it's not by being a better doctor and being better at diagnosing if you have syphilis or not. You know, sure, that's valuable. Um, a lot of it's in the very unsexy stuff, image recognition and radiology, um, insurance billing reconciliation, um, and this. You know, when you wanna talk about biomedical research, the thing that gets all the attention is protein folding. And that is truly magnificent. The protein folding predictions from the amino acid sequence is mind boggling. Um, and that will absolutely shave some time and money off drug discovery. But if, if AI could solve this quote unquote simple problem, I say simple in conceptual terms, not technical terms, you change nutrition science. You really start to answer questions that have vexed us for hundreds of years. And, uh, so anyway, I, I hope somebody out there is who's got serious AI chops is listening to this and thinking this is an area to pursue.